We'll start. We'll record lights on. Oh, more people coming. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> welcome to how to be an automation professional. Hopefully, we can, this, this illustrates a problem of what we're having in the industry. We don't have a lot of people getting into a great profession. So, we're here to tell you a little bit about it, uh, give you some information, tell you how we ended up getting into it uh, from way back. I got a, I got a number of people from a number of different roles within uh, the automation industry that might be of interest to you. So. Um, We'll go through and uh, give you our spiel that you talked with us. And at some point, we'll, towards the end, we'll, we'll hopefully we can get a good dialogue. If you've got questions, we can do some good conversation here because we'll probably get a lot more out of it. If you've got questions or things about this that you want to find out about, that's the best way to learn. So figure it out. So we'll we'll try to not put you to sleep for the first little bit of it here. Uh, and indulge me, and uh, we'll go from there. Can you flip? Um, what is automation? Uh, good. Fortunately, I had a lot of practice over at our Automation Federation booth. If you've not been over there um, at the uh, Innovation Alley, uh, we have a booth over there. Uh, but first of all, the Automation Federation is a group of professional people that do automation for a living. And we're here working with FIRST as an alliance partner to really promote STEM, help promote uh, and foster uh, things with FIRST uh, and also be an, uh, a resource for you, the individuals in FIRST, to learn about uh, different great career options, which is the whole objective of the Innovation Alley. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you get a chance to come by, but I, mean, see, I think you'll get a, a much more uh, uh, thorough indoctrination here than you will at the booth, but I've been practicing the spiel a little bit, doing the five-minute version over there, so we'll probably drag it out a little bit more here. But uh, you know, automation, what is automation? Uh, big question, and everybody has a really uh, different answer for that. But if you look at uh, everything that goes on around us, there's, there's a horrendous amount of stuff. Uh, it's making machines do what they're supposed to do. You've done it with the robot. It's good English there too, so don't go by what I'm an engineer. I'm not an uh, English major, so. But but you, if you've done the things there, you've understand it. That's really what what automation is. It's making the machines or equipment do something with some sort of a control component. So that's what it is. It's not just robotics. People say, oh, automation. Oh, it's robots. Well, robots is part of it, but that's not all of it. So it's really what we hope to get you hope you get out of this is really a better sense for what it is and really see that it is a, a, a fantastic uh, career opportunity for you that can really cover a wide range. Um, I'll eventually introduce all the individuals up here and, and they'll, they'll all get the chance to talk about what they do for their jobs, where their career, how their career started, how they got into what they're doing. So uh, next slide. Automation is, if you think about it, all that I'll give you a bunch of different examples, but automation is, uh, think about things that make a building work. There's, there's automation in place here in this building, all the HVAC, the heating, the cooling, those types of things uh, that take place in a building. Something has to control all that and make that work, just like it has to control your robot. So there, it's air conditioning, heating, it's lighting, turn off and on, energy conscious is, uh, is, is, is very high now, and so people are very, very in tune to making sure that buildings are green. We do things uh, when we design buildings that, that automate the lights, daylight harvesting, things like that that save energy. But all again, think about it. How does that work? It's not somebody running around turning switches off. It's, it's a control somewhere turning on lights based on what, what needs to be happening there. Security is another part of the building. How do you get in? You got the card and access come in, all those types of things. It all goes back to a control system. Um, fire alarms, the same thing. So it's all tied together so that the building works uh, uh, hopefully safely and effectively for those people that are in it as occupants. Next slide. Um, automation is getting water to your home. Uh, think about that. Uh, you got to pump it out here, we pump it out of the river. You may not think that's very appetizing, but it is. They clean it up. Uh, but there's plants and processes that, that go through and, and, and handle the water, pump it, clean it up, filter it, treat it, put chemicals in it. But again, all that is touched by some automation. Again, machines and equipment doing things 
uh, day in, day out. So there's water treatment pump, it is a water tower, there's a water tower that keeps it uh, pressurized to your home. There's controls and level sensors that, that start and stop the pumps that keep the water uh, a certain level in the tower so that, that you have the same water pressure in your house. That's how those work. So it's really, you know, again, another point of where it's around here. Even all the way down to your water meter, they got to charge you for the water, they got to make the revenue so they can afford to, to put the systems in place to provide water. So your water meter ties in, it's automatically read and a lot of cases and figures into the equation. So next slide. Automation is fun stuff too. It's uh, a lot of different stuff. If you look at uh, everything that has to work and, and operate in the car, think about a car factory. And, and a lot of you, as we talk, uh, you resonate and understand. You watch how it's made videos and the other cool factories and those types of things. And a lot of you guys are, ooh, that's cool. Well, every bit of that you see is automation. So if you look at a car factory, an oil refinery, a cookie factory, a chemical plant, or M&M's and Snickers factory, which is actually in the picture there, all of that is, again, automation. There are great careers, great things that you can do there. It's taking those pieces of that equipment and making it happen. You know, here we got the M&M's coming down the line, going into the bag. Uh, so it's, again, how it's fascinating if you watch through there to see all those cool things happen. Next slide. Uh, automation is uh, amusement parks. Uh, uh, that's fun. I've actually done, got to do some amusement parks. Uh, it's a much younger me on the right and my son, my daughter, and my niece riding a roller coaster that I got to help design. So if you think about a roller coaster and amusement park rides, if you've been there, if you've been to SeaWorld in Orlando, uh, did a large ride there where you really basically it's a roller coaster and a boat ride walk, going through there, all the animated props and lights as you go through the control system for the cars and the boats actually talk to the other control systems that control all the animated props and all the lighting and so as you go through see a lot of things happen it looks like it somebody's standing or turning switches on again no it's all automated there's all systems controls sensors that go through there so next slide uh, that's what automation looks like. It's, it's kind of funny, it's kind of scary, and it's really not as exciting as peanuts. This is actually a pharmaceutical plant, and the automation is all around it. You see on the picture on the left, there's a little, it looks like a little silver pot in the middle that's about the size of a big uh, cook pot. Uh, that's actually the vessel that has the stuff in it. All the stuff around it is instrumentation and device and things that measure what's going in there. They're actually, in that one, they're actually growing uh, some uh, a spore, a living spore type organism. Uh, it's all the sensors and things that keep that alive. It's oxygen to put into there. It's media. It's keeping the pH. It's keeping the temperature precise. But there's a lot involved to make sure that that stays healthy and viable and grows. On the right is you know a type of plant where you have a huge control room. Somebody's got to sit back and watch all that equipment. You can't see into it, can't watch it, but you got all those sensors and things that are telling you what's going on. You sit back on a computer screen and see what's happening. Next slide. Um, yet again, another one, this is where, you know, taking pharmaceutical stuff and, and filling line where you're actually taking empty bottles and running down and putting a medicine product or drug product in there. Next, next slide. Um, close up, this might start looking a little familiar to you. Um, some of the sensors, again, you know, you probably have very similar type stuff on the robots. On the lower left there, there's, uh, you know, infrared or camera system that actually is looking at it, it's inspecting, it's seeing, and making sure things are in the bottle, right? The label's on the bottle, things like that. So that's a close up to the machine. Uh, and then again, the favorite one. The one on the left, again, it's not very exciting because you can't see what's going on, but you, inside they're mixing all the colors to add to the M&Ms. And on the right, you see the result. This is big old conveyor belt, which is really cool to watch this thing, just this stream of M&Ms coming off. They all fall out of the hopper. It mixes on the conveyor belt. They go into where they print the little M&M &M letters on them and put them in bags. So next slide. You know, more candy. Everybody likes the candy. So you know, on the left is a big conveyor belt actually going through, and it actually has the little Snickers mini bars on it. So again, all the machines, they mix all that stuff. This plant is about a half a million square feet building. It's probably the size of this America Center in Topeka, Kansas, and it basically has train cars bringing all the ingredients in one end and packaged M&Ms come out the other. And it was all designed, built, and all the automation to do all that, mix the stuff up, <clears throat> put it out, spread it out, cover it in chocolate, put it in packages, and ship it away. 
So from front to back, it takes probably less than an hour for some ingredients to go all the way through and end up in a package. Was automate, why is automation important? Uh, quantity, quality, and quickness. Is, I guess I was trying to come up with three cues and things like that. It's, that was the best I could do. Give me a break. I'm an engineer. I'm not a marketing guy. But quality, I mean, automation does do that for you. If you look at all the things we're doing here and if you know, why automation, if you look back over history and back, everybody did things by hand and then they did it by machine. Um, more and more they've got where it actually allows you to do things repeatedly consistently and much faster and more efficiently. A uh, good example is I grabbed a picture years back, if you, some of you may remember, the, the, where you built the robots to throw the Frisbees. And you scored points for how many, and so part of it was the, the machine was basically designed, and I loved it when you, somebody figured out and built a system so it sat back there, docked against the wall, and you just sit there and fed Frisbees, and it just fired them all the way across right through the slot. Once you get it dialed in, set up and adjusted right, you can really crank through and do a lot of things fast. So that's the concept of automation. So, you know, you guys, again, you guys are doing it. Next slide. Um, how to become an automation professional. The challenge with, with automation professionals and at certain levels is there really isn't a degree program for it and people don't know about it as well. It's not as easy to find out. There are a lot of degree programs, technician programs, things at lower levels, two year, four year, or two year degrees, but as if you look at an engineering level, there's not really an engineering degree. So it's where, you know, there. But you've got a lot of education, but in, you know, also automation is not all engineering. It's, it's everything from a technician. People have to maintain service. People have to build a program and do all these things so that you can go from tech school to trade school, a lot of people from the military, good technical training. And a lot of people from the military can learn a lot of things, uh, you know, understand, work with technology of all different types and, and, and apply that to automation. Uh, community colleges and universities, so there's a range of stuff. And everything with the exception of the university probably has some sort of a, an automation program. There's a lot of community colleges at, at that level that, that, that provide some technical level training. Uh, universities, uh, it's probably, you know, the, the, the challenge there is what degree program you go into. Uh, three, three programs that, that are predominant are, are uh, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, or electrical engineering. And they all have some aspect of automation. If you think about automation as far as doing things uh, in a factory or whatever, you have the machines, the designs, the mechanisms, things that are designed there. You also have the electrical control system components and things like that. So it's a mix of the two. If you go to a processing plant where you're making chemicals and refining oil and those kind of things, think about a chemical engineer and a, an electrical engineer combined. And that's the person that's probably more suited for and, and has a lot of the skill set. So uh, the challenge is there's, you, we've got to kind of mesh degrees and make sure that they're, they're available and you have the right, right skill set. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> Again, you can go the full range. Again, it's not just engineering level. Uh, you got technician, you can be, you know, someone who maintains it. You've got contractors, people that build, design, you know, build and fabricate the stuff, uh, programmers, engineers, you know, there's technical sales all the way as well. There's several folks up here from Rockwell Automation I'll introduce in a minute that really cover the technical sales side. Somebody's got to sell the equipment, figure out what you need to do, to, you know, have to uh, go out and produce and, and, and automate your facility. Um, design, you can even get into the design if you don't want, if you want to get into the circuit boards and things like that. There's, you know, somebody's got to design and build those components and controllers that go into the factory anyway. So there is that part of it too, but that's a very small part of it compared to the people that apply it and design it and, uh, and, and stick it on the machine and make things work. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> career paths, again, people tend to go into one and stick with one. Just like any career, you go into a certain uh, uh, technical discipline, whatever, and you'll go into a certain industry group. Uh, you tend to either go into manufacturing, I call that making things. That's like your widgets, your bottles of water, your, your components, your iPhones, whatever. It's a big factory that makes stuff. 
are things. Processing is making stuff. That's bulk. That's a big chemical plant. That's a refinery pumping out thousands and thousands of gallons of gas and truck and pipe it all over. Uh, there's the utilities. You know, think about all your power plants, all your water, uh, how all that works. That's all. There's controls and, and stuff there as well. Transportation and, and, and building automation are, are a few of the key sectors here that you'll you'll look to and be able to find a good job opportunity or good career path. And you'll tend to go into those. This doesn't mean you can't jump around to them, but you'll tend to stay in gravitate towards one and develop expertise and even within there there's a lot of, of all the all the different levels that we talked about excuse me <clears throat> technician uh, sales all of them have that component so again a very expansive career option a lot of people sit there and say oh, okay you're electrical engineer whatever you're going to go into something there but it's just computers no there's, there's electrical engineering you can go into computers but there's electrical engineering you can go into building systems and engineering facilities and the things so again it's it's a much wider broader uh opportunity than, than people are aware of uh, next slide um <clears throat> Again, where do you want to work too? It's it's a, it's it's a whole spectrum of, of I can work for a company uh, that makes the things or stuff or whatever. Work for there, uh, work for a contractor. Somebody's got to build it. Uh, there's been a lot of shift from companies having engineers in house that do all their work to they outsource it. So they there are a lot of engineering companies. I happen to work for an engineering company that designs uh, pharmaceutical plants for a, a variety of customers. So. <clears throat> That you know that that way we're I'm working on the same type of stuff, but I'm working for different clients, doing different products on every job almost. So, quite a variety. Um, or you can work for yourself. But again, it's just like any other career, uh, any other type of discipline, whatever other automation is going to follow the same basic path. But you start seeing that there's a uh, a lot of options from an education. There's a lot of options from industry sector. There's a lot of options you can choose things that interest you and fit you better uh, as you go through here and different ways to work. So again, job opportunities are quite quite varied and quite quite uh, uh, prevalent. Go ahead. <coughs> and I will uh, introduce our group. They're going to talk a little bit about where they where they came from, how they got here. Kind of like as I said in the intro, the. The sixth grade to where we are now, as far as professionals in, in there. Uh, Curtis Kali. 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 Everyone. <laughs> I've only worked with you for a while. I always call you just Curtis, but Curtis Kali is uh, a mechanical engineer that works for CRB. I work with him. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about his background. Uh, Teresa Lanuza, she also is a CRB employee. She'll, work, uh, she'll talk a little bit about hers. Uh, Luke Manier with Rockwell Automation. Uh, Michael at and Amadola, Admiral, I keep Amadola. I just mentioned this morning. Sorry, but uh, also for Rockwell Automation, we'll talk about what they do as far as more on the technical sales and equipment supplier side. So hopefully, we'll go through, give you a good variety of stuff uh, to see what uh, different jobs are like, a little bit, and then we'll open up to questions and let you talk and grill us and find out more if you're interested in some of the things we've shown you. So with that, Curtis. Yeah. How long do you want me to get? Oh. 10, 15. Okay, I'll try to keep it short then. So some of you I thought were probably looking at, at me up here and thinking, why is the child presenting? Uh, why is someone who's still in high school up here to speak authoritatively on automation? Uh, you were wrong on both counts. I'm 25, so I've been working with Steve for about three years, and I cannot speak authoritatively on automation because I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, he, th he thought it'd be good to give a little bit of introduction on each of us. So. Uh, there, I have a couple pictures in here. This is me at the Earth Day Festival this week, getting eaten by a dragon. Um, we were, I'm, on the, I'm on the board of that festival in St. Louis. Uh, I play uh, music quite a bit. Uh, this is me playing at church. I was in an acapella group in college uh, and in a band as well. Go to the next slide. Um, I also do some political advocacy because I think it's important for uh, policymakers to understand science. So this is uh, at Claire McCaskill's office. And I thought I'd mention that I was on a uh, first team uh, when I was in high school, team 2521, uh, out of South Eugene High School in Eugene, Oregon. We were the robot ninja monkeys because apparently we couldn't pick just one name. We had to go with all three of those names at the same time. So as far as a uh, kind of career path, I guess in high school, like, I was kind of typical engineer in terms of like my interests. I did, you know, I really liked math. I really liked physics. I really hated literature. Um, I didn't really like chemistry very much either. Uh, and I thought that was kind of funny looking back on that, kind of how your interests change over time. Because 
like, I just thought it was super boring to learn chemistry, right? It's, it was like all memorization in high school, but now like getting out into industry, actually what a lot of the chemical engineers do, I find extremely interesting um, and, and really complicated. And so I just, I think it's funny to like highlight the difference between how, how learning something in school can be completely different than applying something in school. And like really I had no, no concept or idea of what it was like to do something um, until after I had kind of done it and not just learned it. Um, so in college, I did a couple of things. I went to Wash U, uh, just down the road in St. Louis. Um, I was on a team that did brain-computer interfaces at one point. So the basic idea is that you put an electrode on someone's skull or drill into their head and if they let you. They usually don't if you're an undergraduate. I can't tell why. Um, but <laughs> they'll, so you'll take a signal off of someone's brain using EEG or ECOG, uh, and then we would control a, a hand externally like, uh, for patients that had traumatic, traumatic brain injuries or uh, suffered strokes so that they could kind of uh, figure out how to grasp again, you know, do basic things like grab a cup. Um, I also worked on fuel cells in that role. Sure, that's fine. Um, so, yeah. Uh, in college, I was gonna, I was gonna say that uh, I highly, highly recommend uh, that fuel cell program that I did was called an REU. Um, it's research experience for undergraduates. It's, it's funded through the National Science Foundation. Um, those are really, really good opportunities. I definitely encourage you as you go on to like just try as many things as you can. Try research, try industry, try whatever. Uh, and that's just a particularly good um, opportunity. You can keep moving. Um, then I did a co-op uh, at a company also in town that worked on a lot of renewable energy. You'll kind of see that as a, a little bit of a theme as renewables and sustainability. Uh, so this is a project that we worked on where there were, um, I think there were 80,000 mirrors and then these, this is a, a different version of the same thing, but there are 80,000 mirrors. The, the farthest mirrors were like two miles away or so from the tower. The tower was like one and a half times the height of the Statue of Liberty. And the idea was to reflect a bunch of sunlight all up to these towers and then use that to make steam to make power. Um, so that was a really cool project opportunity that I got to work on. And the automation behind that is, is unbelievably complicated also to get all of these you know, thousands and thousands of mirrors to reflect all to this, to this one central point um, all at the same time. Um, so I was gonna talk a little bit about mentorship because I think uh, in my career, like finding mentorship is one of the very, very most important things. Uh, I put a picture of Steve up here. Uh, I, don't, I don't, did you ever actually wear this for Halloween at the office or, no, no okay. I just, you just, I wish you had at one point, but you know, we can fix that in, in coming years. Um, but I, I put a picture of Steve up here just because he's been a phenomenal mentor for me. Um, and I think, you know, I've, I've worked at places where there was really good mentorship and worked at places where there was not very good mentorship. And the difference is absolutely night and day. Like, when you start out at these places, as smart as you think you are, as smart as I thought I am and still, frankly, have plenty of that ego, like, these guys know a million times more than me, right? Like, no one is born with this innate sense that you have to use AISI 316L stainless steel in, you know, to, to make pharmaceuticals, right? Like, you just, you can't just intelligence your way at that. You have to, you have to learn that kind of stuff through experience. And so, um, like, meeting these people and learning from them and asking them questions, people, you know, good mentors love uh, having questions is, is super important um, and connecting with coworkers and, and trying to build those relationships in the office is unbelievably important. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, we can skip these. I'm trying to, <laughs> yeah, we can skip a couple. Uh, do one back, sorry. Yeah, so what do I actually do? Uh, so I'm a mechanical engineer there. So uh, I work some, in, some of the in some of the same uh, industries that Steve works in. So we do a lot of um, like drug products and food. I like to say we work on drugs and candy. It gives, makes people cringe a little bit when we say that, but it's true. Um, and I work a lot on sort of the support systems within a facility. So uh, water purification is an example, um, but also you know, high purity steam, high purity compressed air, uh, heating and cooling, Lots of things like that, and I'm, I'm pretty interested in sustainability as well. Um, so I can't tell you about uh, automation, really, in particular, but I can tell you a lot about becoming a professional, I think, and I think there have been a lot of things that have surprised me about that, so I won't go into detail about that um, right, right now, but uh, yeah, so I just wanted to highlight that in the long run. I guess I had one more thing on here, that professional organizations are, are really good, this is sort of out of order, but um, 
just as a professional, that looking for professional organizations is really, really helpful um, when you're trying to network and trying to meet people and trying to figure out you know, what you want to do. Just like going to a random meeting can be really, really helpful to, to learn what people in the industry care about and meet them and again, just pester them with as many questions as you possibly can. You can find people on LinkedIn, but these are a really good organization too. Um, so automation to me, this is basically what it is. As I've said, I don't know that much about automation, but uh, there are things that go into it, the gazintas and the things that goes out of it and the, gazinta, the gazautas. Um, and Steve makes all that stuff work, but I kind of uh, work on, you can go to the next one, on the side of um, sort of feeding him the information for what it is that he actually has to automate. So I thought I'd give an example. I don't know how well you guys can see this. The intent wasn't for you to be exactly able to follow every little line in here. Um, but just an as an example of something that we might automate, this is a heat exchanger. So uh, as the name kind of suggests, it makes things hotter or colder. So you put in steam on the one side, and you take out condensate on the other side, so it condenses, energy is released, right? Water comes in the other side, water goes out, it goes out hotter. Um, so this is the kind of document that I would give to Steve. Um, you can see like some temperature elements in there uh, that TE would sense the temperature, as you might guess, and take the signal over to uh, a temperature control valve, it should be TCV, I think, um, and that would modulate the flow of steam. So this is kind of a, a, a simple example. There are much, much more complicated examples, kind of like the tanks that Steve was showing earlier, um, where you'd have a PNID like this, and you'd have, it'd be, you know, four pages, each of which are that huge, where, where it's just essentially all automation information. But just to give you an idea of kind of the information that I would feed to automation professionals and how we kind of interact. You gotta turn it on if you want. Um. Hello, um, I'm Teresa, and I'm going to use this microphone because this is a little too tall for me, and you won't be able to see me. Um, I'm here to talk, well, I think Steve got me here to talk to everyone here, but especially girls, and we have two. So this is the issue that I'm going to talk about in engineering in general, especially in automation. So we have two girls, so you guys can pay more attention to me. Uh, first thing, I just wanted to give you a quick intro, but I think they did a really good job saying what automation engineers do. I'm an electrical engineer. I get into some automation. I'm trying to learn from Steve, but um, I'm, I do more of the electrical side of things. But yeah, I have some examples in here. I think this is they're packaging bread in there and some bottles in here. And it's just um, automated machines and processes to make everything faster, quicker. What was it? Quicker, quality. What was your quality other cue? Quality, and I don't remember. Quicker. Exactly. You can go to the next slide. It's very important. Very important. Remember. Remember. Next slide. <laughs> um, so um, I wanted to tell you what I decided to be an engineer. So um, I put this little minion example in here because this is pretty much what I do as an electrical engineer. Just connect something so, to make it work. Um, and I wanted to be an engineer because simply I didn't want it to see my work just on paper. I wanted to do something and then like, be able to go to a factory and see how it works or see how it's helping someone or see how it's making the world somehow better in some way. So it's just a very, very good way to do things like, and stuff like Steve just said. Just not put everything on paper. Um, problems I faced. I'm a girl, and that was a problem because when I said I wanted to be an electrical engineer, I mean, some people were very supportive, my parents were very supportive, but there were other people that were like, why don't you do, like, something more girly, you know, something a little more like literature or something like that, and I was like, well, I like that, but I want to be an engineer, and I don't see a reason why being a girl would make me be less less of an engineer, or I'm not less intelligent, I'm not, nothing in a girl is different in her brain. We, it might even work better sometimes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, and according to the Congressional Joint Economic Committee, 14% of engineers in the U.S. are girls. So we are really a minority in here. And instead of seeing this as a problem, I try to see it as an opportunity. When you come into this field, you're an asset. It's really, there's, there's things that we bring to the industry that are really good. And I think we all, guys and girls, bring um, ideas into the industry in different ways, but they're all very valuable. So I think that seeing that 14% and try to make it 
a bigger number someday. It's a goal that we should all have. And I would love to see more girls in engineering because I feel like girls bring their own kind of um, ideas into this field and it's really important. Uh, reasons why girls don't go into engineering. Lack of female engineering role models. I'm there, that's me and my friend Shannon. Um, we both graduated as electrical engineers, so there's a role model for you if you didn't have one. Because if you Google this, you won't get much. You will get a couple black and white pictures, um, but you will get a couple people, but not much. If you uh, look up male engineer role models, you'll find like a thousand. So it's very important to get more people in there. Um, maybe some of us might become famous and you'll be the role model for all the girls in the world. Maybe one of you too. Um, there's a stereotype out there that also links masculinity to um, technology, and, and it's a thing. When you think of an engineer, if I tell my friends I need to go talk to my boss, and they know that my boss is an engineer, they assume it's a, it's a guy. They always assume my boss is a guy because my boss is an engineer. So there's still that um, stereotype in society that we need to fight. I like to go out and tell people, hey, I'm an engineer, and this is how engineers look like, and I'm not a guy. <laughs> Well, they, they noticed that. Um, so there's misconceptions on what, it's, what it is to be an engineer. Uh, people think you have to look a certain way. You have to be um, always in the computer. You have to not get any sunlight. You have to be a boring person. You don't have a personality. You just like math, and that's not true. Um, so I wanted you guys to check out, well, I'm sure, do you guys have Instagram or Twitter? Or any of that, you do? Okay, so last year there was a trend on Instagram, a hashtag, I look like an engineer, and I thought it was really cool because there were people from all over the world putting pictures up of, hey, I look like this, I do cool things like this, like Kurt was saying. He does a bunch of cool things and he's still an engineer, so you can still be cool and be an engineer. And that's something that I think we need to work on and making society know that you can be a cool, person and do other things and be intelligent and be an engineer too. So if you can go to the next slide. I got some pictures of, um, these were uh, four girls that I found that I thought were really cool with this hashtag I look like an engineer uh, trend that happened on Instagram. So this girl was a chemical engineer. Um, this girl uh, works in satellite images. This girl works at GE, and this one used to build an autonomous uh, robots in high school, and she has a computer science degree right now. So they all posted their pictures that just shows their personality, and they show, hey, I'm not, maybe this is not how you expect that an engineer to look like, but that's me. So these are all the people I graduated with. So I graduated with around 20 people at SLU. I went to St. Louis University here. And um, for the first time in the history of the school, we were 60% girls in my class and 40% guys. And it was, it was pretty awesome and it was a little confusing for my professors because they weren't used to all the girls. Um, but it was great and like they're all very successful right now. They're all 23 years old and they're, one of them designs um, unmanned aircraft, aircraft systems. Uh, she's a medical student. She has an electrical engineering degree uh, with an emphasis in bioelectronics. So she's gonna be able to be a doctor that also, and she also can work in medical devices because she knows how the circuit works. So she's, she's, she's gonna be good. Um, then I have another friend who's a sales engineer right now. Um, and this one, Shannon, works on secret government projects, so I really can't tell you what she does, but it has to be cool because she can't tell anyone. Um, so, you wanna go to the next slide? Um, and these are just uh, a little slide idea telling you what things are not required to be an engineer. You don't have to be a guy. Even though people assume when you send your business, when you send an email and it says you're an engineer and they, if your name is Alex and they don't know if you're a guy or a boy, they're gonna think, a guy or a girl, they're gonna think you're a guy. They're always gonna think you're a guy. So you just kinda need to fight it. I like to be very upfront about like, this is me. I'm a girl, I have a personality, and I'm an engineer. And I like to be very upfront about this, to break the stereotype. Um, you don't have to be a genius. I was definitely not a genius. I'm still not a genius, but I'm working on that. Um, and you don't have to be the first in the class to be an engineer. So um, I was decent at math, but I wasn't the best. But I worked really hard, and I studied really hard. I probably worked harder than a lot of more like smarter people than me. But um, 
now I have an engineering degree and I did really well. So it's just studying hard. It's not really being a genius. It's more of the hard work that pays. Uh, and you also need higher education. And this is really good tip. When you go into STEM fields, when you go into any science, it's a lot easier to find scholarships because there's a lot of companies trying to push people to go into this field. So if scholarships are a good incentive for you, this is really good, go into a STEM field. Uh, and if you want to work in automation, you can be an electrical engineer, chemical engineer, what Steve just said. That's it. You want to talk about me? Um, no. Oh, if I want to talk about you. No, you can talk about yourself. You're good at that. Sure, sure that. I'm, I'm good at that. Thank you. Uh, she's a pleasure to work with. Uh, she is quite fun, she is, as you can tell. Uh, again, my name is Steve Flantz. Um, uh, I've been doing work for in the engineering and automation world for about 30 years, so way older than every, but most everybody in here, uh, basically. Uh, so that's my day job. Uh, I also volunteer, Curtis mentioned about the professional organizations, the Automation Federation. Those of you who stopped by the booth uh, kind of found out what we are, but I'm actually the president of ISA, which is a professional organization that founded this group. And it's really basically put in a group of organizations together like SWE and a few others that really want to promote STEM be there as a resource to talk to, to young people coming up of how what they can do career-wise and, and how we can help mentor you and, and give you information to get you into a good career that, that you find fun and fulfilling. Uh, my background is I started out, uh, the, the tractor is actually older than me, uh, but I was and I actually went to a one-room school. I grew up on a farm in rural Missouri. Uh, Grew up, went to a one-room school. There were 18 kids in the school, complete grades one through eight, but I still made it, did well. I was top of my class. I was the only one in my class, so that was an easy competition. Uh, sometimes I came in second, but I don't know. It was the other me. Uh, next slide. Um, why I became an engineer? Okay, I'm a farm kid, you know, farm kids and kids with our background tend to be very strong engineers and actually well sought after. Um, so that doesn't mean go out and move and live on a farm, but if you want to, it's not a bad way to go. But you know, if you think about it, farm kids, you're out there, equipment, machinery, you're messing with stuff, you're tinkering with stuff, you know, you're bored, you're out in the, in the country, nobody's around, so you gotta find something to do. So you start tearing lawnmowers and things apart. I love to work on stuff, mess with stuff, take it apart, figure out how it worked, do all that kind of stuff. So I was a tinker. Electronics fascinated me. Uh, I love science. I love that class. Now the key is here as I don't love math. I'm good at it, but I don't love it. And the thing about engineering is everyone says, oh, you got to be good at math. You got to love math and all those stereotypes, kind of as Teresa said. And also that, okay, you're going to do, the, the, the good news is you're not going to do math uh, day in, day out. I haven't done calculus in 30 years since I graduated college, nor will I ever. As Curtis was joking, he said he almost did an integral once, but he, he, he lucked out and didn't have to finish it. So you, you don't need to do that stuff. And, and your job as an engineer is not going to be gross. You know, boring, mundane, cranking through stuff. There's a lot of fun stuff, as I illustrated, you know, automating roller coasters and factories that make cool things. It's a little more fun. And again, it is literally like the job you did building your robot. So it's, it's, it's way cool. But again, you don't have to like it. You just got to do it, go get through college. The rewards are phenomenal. Um, you get great careers. Next slide. <laughs> Um, what really got me going was, uh, and actually I had a Tonka dump truck that vintage, that's probably a late 60s model, so yeah, I'm old. Um, but I had uncles that were engineers, and I guess the one that, that really got me going was my uncle took us through the factory, Tonka toy factory, and I was sitting there, yeah, I was looking at all the toys, but I'm sitting there looking at all the machines that are conveying all the pieces through and dipping them into paint, paint vat and all the thing, and that was just awesome. It's like, ooh, how does all this work, and how do we make this happen? And that's probably really what, what got me going. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I picked, you know, I fortunately had a lot of role models. I had a lot of people to talk to, so I actually knew what I wanted to do well ahead of time. 
which is the, the perfect dream, and your parents would love you to do that so that you don't spend a career finding things in college that you want to try and, and on and on and on. So uh, the idea is, is really I thought about it. I had decided, well, before I even got to college by my junior year in high school, I knew I wanted to be an electrical engineer, and I knew people, so I understood a new automation and controls was something I wanted to go into. So I actually had it picked out. So I there, I did a lot of uh, research. I actually got a, a co-op program where I actually worked for about two years worth of time in while I was in college and actually did automation work. I was in a factory that made shingles. I actually worked on design control systems and programmed one. One was to stack pallets of, of shingles, shingles on pallets. So I actually got to do real stuff. So, you know, palletizer is a little more complicated than your robots, but, you know, nothing that you guys couldn't handle without, without any trouble at all. Next slide. Um, so my career path, I went through a lot, I've worked for a lot of companies and I've done a lot of neat things. Uh, I've, I've had the opportunity, you know, okay, shingles, not too exciting. That was there, tech systems there, air products, chemical plant, uh, you know, all kinds of grain milling, extracting vegetable oil out of soybeans, uh, Celotex, CRB, uh, the last ones, I, I went through several companies, but the last one is where I actually got to work for a while. We got to do work on roller coasters and amusement parks. And again, a lot of fun stuff there. You don't think about the automation and work that goes in there, but stop and think. Next time you go to the amusement park, ride the roller coaster, thank the automation professionals that they know how to do that and do it right and make it safe so that the roller coaster doesn't have a mishap and you don't end up on the evening news. Uh, so the safety reliability is all there. A lot of neat things. Think about uh, a water theme park like SeaWorld, all the equipment that has to go back in the background, purifying the water for the whales and the things like that. So uh, there's a lot of cool stuff there. Uh, they do a really cool job of hiding it all. It's all behind and you don't see all that ugly stuff, but there's a lot of neat stuff back there. Next slide. And Michael, you're up. <clears throat> All right, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Amendola, and I'm a field engineer with Rockwell Automation. So first thing, what's Rockwell Automation? If you haven't been across the street yet, we have a really awesome booth. You can play tic-tac-toe against a robot, uh, and you can learn a little bit more about what Rockwell does. But what Rockwell Automation is, is we're an industrial automation company. What we've been talking about so far is automation. We're behind the scenes on everything that you guys use and buy. So from the food that you eat, the clothes you wear, the car you drive, automation is what makes all of those things possible. And Rockwell Automation is a company that makes the controls that makes all those things possible. Uh, I'm a field engineer, which means my job primarily is to go out to all those different facilities, all those different manufacturing sites, um, and upgrade their equipment, uh, work on their equipment, make sure it runs properly, uh, help them solve a problem, help them figure out what, what they need to do to make their lines more efficient, get more cars out the door, uh, you know, get more, uh, get more Pepsi made, all of that sort of stuff. So becoming an automation engineer, uh, so my early education, when I was a kid, when I was, you know, your age a little bit before, I liked to fix things, and I put fix in quotes because I didn't always fix things. I broke things a lot. Um, I used to, you know, just play with things, see how things worked. I always had this, uh, this inquisitive mind of wondering how it worked, why it worked. Uh, my cousin one time told me, oh, well, the NES is broken, the Nintendo Entertainment Center, which you guys probably are too young to know. Um, but the NES was broken, and he goes, oh, well, we're just going to throw it out. I said, hold on, let me see what's going on. I opened it up, and I found a loose connection in it, fixed the connection, NES is working, I'm playing Mario Brothers again. So it's, it's a matter of just trying to get that, uh, that thought process in your head of, if I like doing things, if I like fixing things, maybe an engineer is for me. I went to high school, got, uh, we got involved with the robotics team. Now, my robotics team in high school wasn't as cool as first. Uh, my high school, we, used, we did what was called Best Robotics. It's one of the many spawn-offs of First Robotics. It's more like FTC than FRC. But it was still a lot of fun, and it got me involved in robotics, and it got me understanding the mechanical side of things, the electrical side of things, all of that. Um, we also had an engineering tech class in college that I took. Uh, again, starting to understand more of what engineering was, and it got me thinking maybe I should be an engineer. So when I got to college, I went to Ohio State University, um, and I, I started studying engineering, and I studied mechanical engineering. 
Um, and I, I got a, a co-op a co at Crown Packaging Technologies and at Rimrock Corporation. At Crown Packaging, we were, it was a manufacturing facility. So I got to see how bottle caps were made, how different jar containers were made, lids. Um, and it got me wondering, well, that's kind of cool designing the lids, but it's really cool watching the machines pump those out and seeing hundreds and thousands fly off the line at a time. So. My next co-op was at Rimrock Corporation, which was an equipment manufacturer that built machines, built robots, and, uh, and, and built those type of uh, machines that go into automation. Uh, and that's when I started discovering code, and I started discovering that I like to program things. So yeah, I have a degree in mechanical engineering, but I mostly work within programming. I really don't do very much mechanical stuff anymore. And that's what led me to Rockwell Automation. Um, go ahead, next slide. So we'll, we'll see if this video plays, but this is a project that I was recently working on. This is a palletizer. So what that is, is hundreds and hundreds of aluminum cans that get pushed onto a pallet. We'll see if it, you know, let's see if it can play it. Mm. There it goes. It's a little, you know, the computer's loud. So in a second here, you'll see all those cans push forward, but basically everything that you're seeing here in this facility is all automated. So there's, well, well video's a little choppy. <laughs> It's a little smoother than that in real life. Um, but essentially, what's going on is, oh, yeah, it's really, really choppy. Um, what's going on is this pallet is being made, and this pallet is then going to get sent to Pepsi or any of the companies that are filling these cans with, uh, with, their, with their liquid and then selling it to you guys. But it's all automated. So from the moment that these cans are starting out as a small little piece of aluminum to the point at which they're made into a can. Oh, you can click to the, you can click to the next slide. That'll, that'll go. There you go. Okay. So you can see that's what a can starts out as. It starts off as a little piece of aluminum, gets pressed until it turns into a can, printed on, and then gets palletized. Then that pallet gets sent over and it gets filled with Sprite. Uh, another uh, a company that I do a lot of work for is all the automotives, GM, Ford. Um, actually, Rockwell Automation is getting highly involved with Tesla right now. Um, but building all of those, and that's a stereotypical little uh, picture that you'll see of, of all the different uh, automotive manufacturers. Twinkies, I have worked at Hostess before. It's a lot of fun watching Twinkies get pushed out on a line. Um, Hostess is a lot of fun. I mean, in general, food plants, you get to work with a lot of those in automation because everything gets made from the batching where they mix all the ingredients together to the point at which you see all those little fun, uh, you know, food getting pushed out on the line. And then also you get the amusement parks, which Steve has been talking about. Um, and automation is involved, heavily involved within, uh, within the theme parks. For the operator presses the button to tell it to go, and from there it takes over, and uh, the automation is telling you, okay, as you enter this room, let this animatronic move, let this video play. When you're watching all the 3D stuff, that's, that's what's telling it to sync up. It's all automated. And that's, that's pretty much... Uh, pretty much what I do. <laughs> uh, next up, next up is Luke. Try this too. Yeah, there we go. Okay, can you hear me? Good. All right, so before I share my automation story with you, I have two questions for you. They're not hard, but just kind of a, we'll flip the script a little bit. So first question is, anybody here actually from St. Louis? Okay, well, on behalf of somebody who was born and raised in St. Louis, welcome. I hope you have a fantastic trip here. Um, we are really proud in St. Louis of having the honor of hosting this event over the last several years. It's, um, it just meant a lot to the community. Um, and I'll kind of roll into my next question, which is, did you know that you are heroes already? Based on the blank stares, I'll say no. So. There are three kids, they're mine, that already think that you guys are heroes. And it's because, one, they're getting out of school on Friday because I'm bringing them down here um, to actually walk around and see the show. And we've done that the last couple of years. That's how important my wife and I think this event is and this topic. Um, I brought my son down when he was four years old for the first time and he couldn't even talk. He was so overwhelmed with what you guys are doing on your teams. Um, so. They think you're heroes because they get to get out of school but for a day, but they also think you're heroes because they absolutely want to follow in your footsteps. So when you see the younger kids coming by, um, taking the time to tell them about what you do, why you do it, 
really makes an impact. So I just wanted to share that with you before I shared my, my story. So, so thank you and welcome. Um, my, story and I'll, my story, and I'll keep it brief, is, uh, is kind of interesting. When I was in your shoes, actually I'll even fast forward, when I interviewed for my first real world professional job in automation, I had maybe one tenth of the understanding of automation that I think you do at this point. Um, so the exposure that you've got right now is just fantastic. But in hindsight, when I look at how I grew up, what I was into, what I got into in high school and college, it was pretty clear that I was always destined to get into an automation career. Um, similar to Mike's, Mike's story, when I was young and growing up, I always thought I was a, a builder and a creator. If you ask my folks, I was always getting in trouble because I was taking stuff apart. So we kind of looked at that from two different angles. Um, when I kind of grew up, I decided when I went into college, I would be a mechanical engineer. Um, and that turned out to be a fantastic choice for me personally. But as I went on through college, I realized that I liked mechanical engineering, but I was also really interested in you know, computers and chemical engineering, electrical engineering, all the other disciplines. So I was really looking for an opportunity to um, get exposure to all those different disciplines and uh, be able to bridge across them. And it turned out that automation really afforded me that opportunity as well. Um, my career actually led me to technical sales, which is a little bit of, I think, a non-traditional career path, maybe something that not a lot of people think about who are in your shoes right now. And uh, I know I certainly didn't, um, never really thought about sales. but. Once I got into it and I realized that it gave me the opportunity to kind of be that problem solver, to see work with a lot of different companies, um, be a really kind of a con consultant, um, understand their business and help them apply technology in order to solve a problem um, that had a you know, financial impact or helped them create jobs or um, help them make their products more competitively. Um, that technical sales role for me just really started to feel natural. So when I was going through school, I, I had an interest in business as well. So you can kind of see a theme. I liked all the engineering disciplines and I liked business. Um, so that kind of helped propel me or you know, kind of got me looking for something and it turned out to be you know, automation and technical sales for me. So um, similar to Curtis, I, I was also involved in a undergraduate research project when I was in college through the National Science Foundation. My focus that God gave me the opportunity to be an astronaut. No, not really. But my project was working on a team of people that were automating um, the, uh, the uh, let's say, the climate control, um, the heating, the cooling, the humidity inside of a spacesuit. So traditionally, when astronauts did EVA or extra ve vehicular activities, they would have to manually control the temperature of their suit. And you can imagine if you're really, really focused on a task at hand in a high risk situation, the last thing you're probably thinking about is how well your body is you know, controlling you know, your, your temperature, et cetera. So, so this was all about you know, creating models for how much heat was generated by an astronaut during certain work. And we automated the control system to control the astronaut's um, you know, temperature. So that was pretty cool. Um, so in my career, like I said, I got out of school. I, I was fortunate to find the automation field. Um, gave me the opportunity to see a lot of different industries, a lot of different, work with a lot of different um, types of people, whether that's chemical, process engineering, electrical, um, and different roles as well, both you know, the people that were designing the control systems, but also the, the people who were figuring out the financial justification for um, for making those investments, so that's been fun. And then now um, I've, I manage a team of technical salespeople and consultants that you know, go out and help our, um, our customers solve problems and uh, at the end of the day, you know, help those businesses be more productive and efficient and profitable and successful. So, so that's my story. So, and again, thanks for being here and coming to St. Louis and good luck to you. And I think, do we have one more? All right. You can use this. Or you can Obviously, use this. yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, I did not make a slide for you. Um, so <laughs> you'll just have to put up with me talking a little bit. Uh, my name is Elliot Pennington. Um, today, I'm actually in technical sales. I actually work for Loop. Um, but my story really went through a much more 
heavy engineering discipline, kind of the path that Mike started, or that Mike's on right now is where I started. So, um, and similar to some of the discussions that, that I know Steve was talking about as far as the co-op experience. So for me, if you'd asked me when I was your age what automation was, I probably couldn't have told you. Um, what I was was the bookworm, right? So I was, I was good at math, I was good at science, I liked playing around with that stuff. Um, so I was really more of a, a problem solver, I'd say. Um, started playing with computers whenever I was really young because my older brother was into it. Not because when you're six years younger than your older brother, you do what he does, right? So, um, so we really started punching in programs whenever I was about four or five years old on a Commodore 64. Um, that was kind of before the Apple II, so. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and kind of built up to the point where, uh, honestly, until the last couple of years, I never bought a computer. I, I bought pieces of a computer and put them together, right? So that, that's how we kind of did those, that thing back then, because uh, I wanted the best pieces, right? I, I could buy something that was already prepackaged, but man, I wanted all the, all the best pieces of the toy to put together, right? So. Um, honestly, finding my way into engineering was kind of a, kind of a strange trip. So, uh, I actually, when I was your age, I, I loved to draw. Um, it's going to sound like an, kind of an odd direction, but, uh, but what it led me to is whenever I got into high school, I took a drafting class because I had to take a shop class and I found out I was an awful wood butcher. So there was no point in me messing around with putting, uh, slabs of board together. So I had to take a shop class of some kind. And uh, drafting was one of them, and heck, I like to draw. So, and I found out I, I really enjoyed it. And then you took it from there, really putting it down on paper, and then moving into computer-aided drafting, into CAD, and uh, and now you could really manipulate things quickly and kind of put it together fast. So, then the next shop class I took, because I still couldn't put things together with wood or metal, so I took an electricity class and uh, found out you could charge capacitors and throw them at your friends and they'd catch them and that, that was fun. But uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> don't tell your parents I told you that. Um, <laughs> so so I, honestly, again, like I said, it was, it was math and science and I started playing around with some of those and, uh, and honestly, what led me to engineering um, was because my dad always talked about the smartest kid he ever knew growing up that was in all of his classes and set all the curves was an electrical engineer that went to Rala, which is a school just down 44 from here. And, uh, and I was pretty cocky as a kid, and I thought, well, I'm the smartest guy I know, so that's what I should do for a living. So, <laughs> so that's kind of how I got into it. Um, went through there, and really, I, I went through two years of engineering school, and it was just math problems, math and science problems for the most part. And after two years, I wasn't real sure why I was even doing the math problems. So similar to Steve, I went and found a co-op and I went to work for six months at a uh, aluminum manufacturer. And uh, the first day I walked in, the engineer that I was working under, he, uh, he threw a couple of ice cube relays down on the table. He said, do you know what those are? I was all proud. Yeah, I, I know exactly what those are. He said, you know how to wire them? I don't have a clue. I have no idea how to wire those. So the first day he spent drawing out ladder diagrams and me wiring those up and changing them, making sure that you know the light turned on at the back end. And the next day he came in and he put a PLC on my desk and he showed me the programming software, which looked exactly like the ladder diagrams we were just doing. And I did the same thing I spent all day doing yesterday in less than an hour. And he said, and that is why we don't use relays anymore. Because <laughs> I can do that a lot faster now. And that was really kind of my introduction. To, I could barely spell PLC, right? So, and that's really kind of the lifeblood of, of the automation industry from industrial automation. So, so I spent six months wandering around an aluminum manu manufacturer, which by the way is one of the most dangerous places I've ever been. So there were lots of ways to get hurt down there. So you really had to, to learn to not back up into things. You watch where you're walking. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, but for me, it was actually nice. I got out of the classroom. I was getting, getting out and getting dirty and actually seeing things work. Um, and watching a bar of aluminum that goes in at about yay big and comes out in, in strips this fast, it goes in real small, but there's nowhere for that metal to go once it goes into the mill. So when it comes out the other side, it's moving pretty quick. <laughs> and uh, it, it was a lot of fun to watch and, uh, and watch spool up. So, 
So I got kind of hooked on that. So when I came back to school, I had a little more focus. I did a couple other co-ops that were also in the automation field. I worked for a systems integrator, which is somebody that goes and actually makes the machines work for a, an end user, for a manufacturer. Um, so I did a couple of those. And, uh, and then I came to work for Rockwell from that side of it. And I really started out doing what Mike did. So um, kind of fell into motion control, which is more servos. Um, so something you guys are very familiar with, playing around here from the robotics side of it. Found out that was much more of a electromechanical discipline, which was fun to me because I got to see things move. So moving bits around in a database is not, not really what tripped it for me. It was more seeing things move. Um, so I did field service for a couple of years. And what I found out is when you're out there by yourself uh, troubleshooting, you either learn to figure that out or you go find another job. <laughs> so, so you spend a lot of time on an island and learning things out. And, uh, and you really learn how to, how to dig through a problem, right? And what I found after two years of digging through the problem was that I wanted to stop fixing other people's problems and I should go make some problems of my own. So <laughs> I kind of moved into a role where I was doing more project engineering and really working with, uh, with equipment manufacturers from that side. So I spent several years kind of working with manufacturers, learning their equipment, showing them how to use our equipment in their applications. Um, so somehow I ended up by accident a programmer, which was never my intention. Um, <laughs> I really wanted to be a circuit designer. That's what I really enjoyed. But, uh, but I didn't do that that much. So, um, so I kind of did that for a while. And then uh, what I found out really was uh, similar to what Luke was talking about earlier, is that uh, you start trying to understand why do, why do companies buy your equipment? Why are they making the decisions that they're making? Why do they buy yours instead of buying somebody else's? Is it technology or are there other decision deciding factors? So I got into that. I, I found really kind of looking at that whole business scope and, and trying to understand what they were doing is still just problem solving. It's the same stuff I was doing when I was six and eight in a math class. It's just a bigger problem to solve, right? There's more, more intricate pieces. There's more variables involved. So, um, so that's kind of the, kind of a, a non-traditional path that I've kind of walked into sales. If you'd asked me when I was in college that if you'd have told me I was going to be a salesperson, I'd have probably laughed at you. So, <laughs> um, but. Uh, but that's kind of, I mean, the interesting thing is I've seen a lot of different things made from that side of it, from coast to coast, and, and been able to travel quite a bit. So there's a lot of opportunities in this area. So. Nice. Cool. All right. Oh. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so really, there, there's six different sort of stories, uh, some similarities, some differences. Um, a lot of different options for you to so I hope that's there now I guess this is a fun part we're gonna you either ask questions or we're gonna ask you questions now you don't have to but uh, the, the idea here is to engage and interact and if you've got any questions for any of us or more information uh, this is your shot uh, I know you usually do we have people walk up to us in the booth and we give them the five-minute version of this and uh, more often than not, we get grilled with a lot of good questions. And uh, so if you got stuff, let me know. Any? I know we didn't cover it that well. But, uh, OK. Well, I do appreciate your time listening to us and, and bearing with us. Uh, thank you all for your help. Uh, these. These folks have uh, spent a lot of time helping support first and do some things as well. They enjoy it. They, it's kind of, a, as Luke said, it's kind of labor of love of coming down here and helping, doing things that we can to support you guys and uh, bring the kids down, show it off, and really inspires a lot of people. So thank you for what you do. Uh, good luck on the competitions, and uh, I'll be watching for you to see if I recognize any of you in the championship round. Hey, Steve. Yes. We would absolutely invite you if you don't have a question for the group. If you want to ask one on one, we're going to be hanging out for a while. So yeah. come track us down. Yeah, if you want, we can. You don't want to ask a question in front of it. Yeah, we'll turn the mics off. We'll make him turn the video off. And we'll, uh, if you want to talk to us one on one, whoever you want to, that's fine. Because 
uh, we're here to uh, offer assistance to you guys. Feel yeah. free to come by our booths. If, like I said, go across the street, stop by any of our any of our booths, ask us more questions there as well too. Have some fun over there. Some really cool stuff to see and do. All right. So. All right. Thank you much. Thanks. Thank you, Thanks, guys.